Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Happy Friday. Thanks so much for tuning in. As you know, we do these extra episodes a week because we have supporters who support our show through Supercast. So if you want to give the show $5 a month, $50 a year, or $500 for a lifetime membership, you can go to realignment.supercast.com, or you can click the link at the top of your show notes. We really appreciate it. It's really helping us expand the show, make it bigger, bigger, and better than ever. Today's episode features Alex Epstein. He is the author of Fossil Future, Why Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. Now, obviously, from that title, you can tell that Alex has a very specific point of view on the issue of the energy mix, whether it's nuclear, coal, natural gas, those things, versus concerns like climate change. So as you all know, this episode is going to give a very specific perspective on this issue, and I'm going to be sure to book a guest this upcoming month in June or July to give the other side of a lot of these debates. So once again, I want the realignment to be a space where we're going to hear different arguments from different people and usually just assume they're acting in good faith when they make those arguments. So really excited for this one. Would love to hear what you think. Other notes, Sagar and I are already getting together our next discussion episode. We're going to record it on Wednesday. So we'd love to hear suggestions from folks about things that we should talk about, whether it's going to be the upcoming recall race in the San Francisco DA's office or anything else. We've had some great suggestions from the audience. So I really appreciate that. You can hit us up at realignmentpod at gmo.com, or you can check the Substack, which is also going out today. There's a link to that as well in your show notes. So all that said, huge thank you to our other supporter, Lincoln Network. Hope you enjoyed this episode. See you next week. Alex Epstein, welcome to The Realignment. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad to speak with you. I like when a book is titled very straightforwardly, so I can just have a pre-written first question. Why, is the, why are fossil fuels the future? Well, there's, there's two aspects of that. Uh, the book is about why I believe they should be the future. But a big aspect of it is actually that to a significant extent, they will be the future. And if we, particularly the United States, try to resist that, uh, and if Europe tries to resist that, I think as we're seeing now, it's going to lead to a lot of suffering uh, while not really changing the trajectory of using more fossil fuels uh, around the world. And so the basic reason why we should, and then this includes some of the factors that lead to why we will, or why the at least the world as a whole will, is one is just energy is extremely important, cost-effective energy. So low cost energy that's reliable, uh, that, that's versatile, that can power any kind of machine, and that can be used on a global scale of billions of people in thousands of places. That determines, do you have the ability to use machines to be productive and prosperous? And without that, life on this planet is really terrible. And for billions of people, it's still pretty terrible. You have 3 billion people, for example, using less electricity than one of our refrigerators. So one is energy is crucial, two is as energy is desperately needed, and then three is fossil fuels are a uniquely cost-effective source of energy. We've been told for the last several years, oh, we're in an energy transition, we're getting rid of fossil fuels. This hasn't been true. Fossil fuels are 80% of the world's energy, which they've been around that for a long time. Uh, their use is still growing, particularly in the parts of the world that care the most about cost-effective energy such as China, what's been happening is we've had an energy addition. So we've been adding some solar and wind in particular, and that has had a lot of problems and I think clearly can't replace fossil fuels. It's made energy more expensive. There have been reliability challenges, but there's something we have to recognize. There's something special about fossil fuels where after a hundred years of energy competition, they are still 80% of the market and the, the, the absolute uh, use of them is still growing. And so what this means, if energy is crucial, if it's desperately needed, and fossil fuels are uniquely good at producing it. This means there are unbelievable benefits to using fossil fuels going forward and unbelievable like apocalyptic harms. And one of my big points as a philosopher, which is my primary background, is that we're trying to think about what to do about fossil fuels, but we are ignoring the benefits of fossil fuels. So we're focusing on side effects, which it's good to look at side effects, namely climate side effects, but we're not looking at the benefits. And the benefits really are a livable world for billions of people. And it's in that context that we need to look at the side effects. And then I find that when you look at the climate side effects of fossil fuels, you recognize that those are actually neutralized and overwhelmed by the climate benefits of fossil fuels, namely the ability to use fossil fuels to power machines that allow us to master the climate. So if we create, say, more problems with drought from 
rising CO2, which is very dubious. We can talk about the details, but in any case, even if that happens, we have a far greater ability to create drought relief. So we can irrigate, we can bring crops from places where they're bountiful to places that they aren't. And that kind of dynamic is why drought related deaths are down 99% over the last hundred years and overall climate related disaster deaths. So all the disaster categories are down over the last hundred years. So if you look carefully at the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels today and what we can expect going forward, it's overwhelmingly positive, which means we should be using more of them and that most places in the world will, even if the United States screws ourselves and tries to decarbonize. You know, I do this a lot. I do three to four of these a week. That is probably the best opening response <laughs> question I've ever gotten, because if you watch this on YouTube, you'll see me just like writing down questions. I have like 10 questions that just came from that. So I, I appreciate you. Is, is, that, is that good that it generates questions? No, it's good because I want to be, I want to be responsive. I, I hate just going down the line of like, Hey, here's this question I wrote 40 minutes ago. Right, I'll just then, ask then you, you this. Then so we wouldn't good. really need you. We yeah, exactly. You. <laughs> <laughs> Let's me do my actual job. So I appreciate it. So, okay. Several different questions. What's in no particular order. So as you said, your background is a, as a, as a, is as a philosopher. Um, I'll ask you a double-barreled question. Um, I'd love for you to just explain like what that means. I think that sounds mm -hmm. kind of airy fairy to people. Yeah. But then the related question to that is as a philosopher, when you refer to something such as like mastering the climate, you know, like, mm -hmm. I was born in the 1990s, like and, you know, you obviously were alive then too. So so much of our pop culture our media science really taught us this idea that like mastering nature, trying to exert control over it, that's a mistaken idea. Like that is, that's, mm -hmm. that's arrogant, that's narcissistic, it leads to disaster. So I'd just love for you to philosophically engage with that idea. And then we'll get into the actual technical aspect of climate mastery. But just what do you think of this idea of trying to master nature while also explaining your background as a philosopher? So, so I'm really glad you asked these questions in particular, because my view is that 90% of thinking properly about the issue and also thinking improperly about the issue comes down to philosophy and particularly your attitude toward mastering nature. I think that is the central issue that is at issue here. So uh, with, let me know if I leave anything out, but so philosophy is really, it's the study of the fundamental ideas that guide our thinking and our action. So many people proceed as if just they don't think about, hey, how am I thinking about things? What are my values? What are my assumptions about the world? But those shape everything uh, that we do. And so I think of being a philosopher as being hyper aware of like, what are the underlying causes of how we're thinking and how we're acting? And when you question those, you often find that there are things guiding you that you wouldn't choose. So an example I already gave, uh, at least by implication, is when we look at fossil fuels, we tend to only look at side effects but not benefits. Now, that's a methodology no one would sign up for. I've never, I've, I ask people, hey, do you believe we should weigh the benefits and side effects carefully? Everyone says yes. But in practice, they don't do it. And I show in Fossil Future, even at the highest levels, like Michael Mann, one of our leading designated experts who's a climate scientist, he talks about the agricultural negative side effects of fossil fuels, but not in a whole book. He doesn't even once mention the benefits, even though fossil fuels feed 8 billion people through uh, fossil fuel powered machines, and in particular through natural gas fertilizer, which we're suffering from today because people like Michael Mann told us we could restrict fossil fuels without any negative consequences. So that's just one issue of you, if you're not thinking consciously about your methodology, including are you weighing benefits and side effects, you will often um, not do it. And uh, so with, with the specific issue of mastery, this is another philosophical issue, which you can think of in today's language as what is your attitude toward Im human impact on earth? And the basic attitude we're, we're taught is twofold. One is that morally it is immoral to impact the planet, including climate. That's why I believe there's so much moral outrage over climate change, because we think it's just a wrong thing for us to impact the climate. Not that it's really going to end the world, but just we shouldn't be doing it. And then the second thing, which is related, which is the idea that if you do impact nature, nature is going to punish you. So this is the idea that human impact is inevitably self-destructive. And one piece of proof that we have this is that if you notice, I talk about this in the book and on my Twitter at Alex Epstein, I share one of these every day, these catastrophe predictions. There, we have 50 years of environmental experts predicting catastrophe. We're going to run out of resources. Pollution is going to overwhelm us. Global cooling is going to kill us. Global warming is going to kill us. None of these have happened. 
And yet they still, everyone still expects them to be right because we have this idea that our impact is destructive. And the basic, the basic premise there is that what, it's what I call the delicate nurture assumption. So the idea that nature exists in a delicate nurturing balance that's stable, sufficient, and safe, but our impact ruins that balance. And so I think this view that our impact is immoral and self-destructive is false on both counts. So on the first, uh, impact, and they're related, impact, including mastery, which is like the highest perspective on impact, that is how we survive and flourish, right? We, if we just leave the earth the way it is, life is terrible. And it's terrible for hundreds of millions of people. Eight billion people is just mass death. There's no getting around that if we don't massively impact uh, the planet. And so if your goal, which I think mine, mine is, and I think others should be, if your goal with respect to the world is you want to advance human flourishing on earth, then you have to recognize intelligent impact is a very high virtue. And this, uh, this goal that we have accepted of eliminating impact is actually evil by the standard of human flourishing and advancing human flourishing on earth. And then this idea that it's self-destructive because nature is a delicate nurture, not true at all. Nature is wild potential. So it's dynamic, it's deficient, it's dangerous. We need to massively, intelligently, productively impact it to make it better. And so just the, the way this will, will manifest itself is with climate. We have this insane idea that the climate is this perfect thing and our only concern should be not impacting it. Whereas when we did that, we had mass death from climate related causes. Whereas by using fossil fuels to master climate, even though we've had one degree Celsius warming in the last 170 years, which by the way, has some positives and some negatives to it, but whatever that has been, has been trivial in comparison to our climate mastery ability. But people don't see that because instead of advancing human flourishing, their goal is eliminating impact. Uh, and they have this idea that our impact is going to destroy us. So they can't see the reality that we're safer from climate than ever. And we can expect to continue being safer from climate than ever because our mastery ability is so high. Hey, and can you actually explain what human flourishing is? Quote unquote, because yeah. I know it's actually, it's, you're, you're saying this term and I think people would think it's just something, but it's an actual idea. So can you articulate what, what that actual objective is? Sure. So, so what human flourishing is, so flourishing in general for like an organism is it's like living to its highest potentials. So is the organism doing really well? And, you know, within philosophy, there are different conceptions of human flourishing. Like people have different ideas about it, but I think some, some fundamentals for purposes of energy are the idea of like a long life, a healthy life, opportunity for fulfillment, and I would say safety. I mean, that's part of long and healthy, right? So those are big elements. And so when you're looking at something like energy, the idea is, yeah, this allows us to use machines to produce a lot of value, including food, clothing, shelter, uh, medical care, education, really everything in the world. And that allows us to live you know, longer lives, healthier lives, safer lives with much more opportunity for um, fulfillment. But the idea is when you're looking at the earth, are you looking at it from the perspective of, we want an earth where, where basically every human being has the opportunity to flourish. And is that our goal? And do we view everything else from that perspective? Or is our goal where the hu an earth where the human beings have as little impact as possible? And we don't really care how life goes for them. What we care about is how little they impact the rest of nature. And I submit that actually all our, our leaders are definitely in the second category and they've actually tricked us most of us to being in the second category. So most people, if you make it clear, want to advance human flourishing on earth, but in practice, they're supporting policies designed to eliminate human impact on earth. And one, one piece of evidence is, as I mentioned, we've got 3 billion people using less electricity than our, one of our refrigerators. And yet almost no one cares about that, or at least they didn't until recently. I think I'm one of the people who made them care, but still it's not that much of a concern. Whereas the idea that a polar bear in the Arctic has to move from one piece of ice to another, like that makes us cry. And polar bear is my favorite animal aesthetically. And, but, and by the way, there are more of them there have been in a long time, but it just shows how, how, how focused we are on, hey, let's stop impacting things. Let's not impact these polar bears versus let's empower and give opportunity to literally billions of people whose life sucks compared to ours because they don't have cost-effective energy. It seems like a way of understanding your framework is this idea of cost and benefits and, and weighing them. So to the polar bear example, and then to the earth example then too, what is our responsibility to other species, the broader you know, ecosystem and just, and just the planet itself? Um, if, if we have this objective of human flourishing, 
where do we stand on the other side of the ledger? Well, I think of it, I don't think of it as a responsibility. I think of it as what you want to achieve your goal in terms of, you know, thinking about the world, like a world that's good for human flourishing is you want a beneficial relationship with the other species. And, and so nature is both a cooperative and a competitive system. And so when we think about it intelligently, there are many things that we want to preserve, many things that we want to sort of preserve in slightly different form, like a polar bear, for example. Like we don't want to just let them roam everywhere. We want to sort of fence them off in one way or, or another, literally or figuratively. Uh, like malarial mosquitoes, we want to kill. And then like I have a dog, Sherlock, and you know, like I, I go to extraordinary lengths for him to flourish, right? Like I'm unusually interested, but it's ultimately about, hey, I'm relating to the rest of nature in a way that's good for me. Or I like, I, I spend a lot of money to live in California and particularly in Laguna Beach. Uh, and because I love nature and I love the ocean. And so I spend like much more of my income than most people would be willing to, to do that. So it's not, it would be crazy to say, oh, I don't like the rest of nature, but the rest of nature is instrumental. So the way to think about it is, the rest of nature is obviously instrumental to human flourishing, but you need to relate to it in a way that benefits humans. Because if you just say, oh, let's preserve nature, unimpacted nature is good, then a lot of human beings suffer and die. Because unimpacted nature is a terrible place for the average human being to live. You know, it's interesting. Let's get into the philosophy again for a second. As you're describing this idea, benefits, like the, those different parts I'm thinking of just like religious traditions. And like, obviously I could only speak to like the Judeo-Christian side of things. So like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak on, you know, Eastern things or even, um, or even Islam. There's this idea within a lot of the environmental movement that there's this sort of, you know, God given responsibility um, towards nature, towards the earth, um, human, you know, human beings are this like elevated, um, you know, this, this, this elevated creature um, on, mm -hmm. on the planet that, sort of elevates us beyond just this like conversation of like benefits and competition. Like how do you respond to the religious, like, and not everyone invokes this side of, but there is obviously a more religiously minded um, side of the environmental movement. Yeah. The issue of the relationship between the environmental movement is, is really interesting because I think of it as a primitive anti-human religion and I, I'm not religious at all, but I, but I think like Judeo-Christian religion in particular tends to be generally pro mastery, although with some qualifications, but if you, and, and certainly like human centered, right? I mean, the idea is definitely like most people in Judeo-Christian religions would agree with my idea that we should relate to the rest of nature in a way that benefits humans. We shouldn't sacrifice for the God of an unimp you know, unimpacted planet or something like that. Um, so I think actually there's the, the environmental movement tends to, when it's really saying we should eliminate our impact, I think it alienates a lot of people with conventional religion, uh, but it does have this religious character because if you say your goal is to eliminate human impact, well, on what? And it's really on earth, but it's the idea of an unimpacted earth, the earth that would exist if we didn't exist. And it really does function as a kind of God that you should sacrifice to, and also that will punish you when you do things uh, that are wrong. So this, I think, I think of it as the environmental religion uh, the modern one, at least, has this basic commandment, thou shalt not impact earth. And then the idea is that if you violate that commandment, earth, the God in this case, punishes you. And and I think all the stuff about, a lot of the stuff about global warming, climate change, the idea that the earth is going to be an inferno is very much a kind of religious hellscape versus like a real analysis. Because if you look at the history of the planet, We've had 15 times more CO2 in the atmosphere. It doesn't even correlate perfectly with temperature, but we have temperatures that are 14 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Just when you have more CO2, basically, the earth is more tropical. It's not a hellscape. It doesn't burn. You can say, I don't want to get there that quickly. That's fine. That's a thing to discuss. But this definitely has this, it's a primitive religious view because this view that the earth is going to punish us for wrongdoing, that's like what people should have believed 5,000 years ago. They should not believe that today when we understand cause and effect and we understand the earth unimpacted is pretty um, inhospitable. So uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of my view on the environmental movement and religion. You know, it's interesting. What lessons then would you take from like the 20th century history of, of the environmental movement, especially pre climate change. So let's say pre late 1970s in the sense that, you know, if you, if you ask people, 
why does Earth Day come about? It's because, you know, rivers in Chicago light on fire. It's because you mm-hmm. have mass deforestation. Look at the former Soviet Union and like the various stands. There's the, you know, like the, I, I can't remember the, the the lake that dries up and it leads to like huge amounts of environmental destruction. How, how do you respond to the idea that you could argue definitely that the like Mother Gaia thing has gone too far in the year 2022, but that that conception especially in the sixties was an important correction to the like mid industrial era excess. It's a really, really interesting question. So I think of it as unfortunately that there's a tragedy that I'm trying to correct in my own way, which is that there's a packaging together of improving environmental quality and eliminating human impact on nature. And those should not be packaged together because they're very different. So when people say, I I talk about this in chapter three of the book, I talk about misleading environmental terminology that causes us to do anti-human things, but feel pro-human. So when you say, for example, save the planet or protect the environment, people think, oh, we're protecting it for us. We're saving it for us. So they think of, oh, clean air, clean water. I get to enjoy natural beauty. But in practice, these terms are usually invoked to just stop us from impacting nature, period. You know, to stop a new road, to stop a new apartment complex, to stop a new factory, just a hostility toward um, impact as such. And what happened, and it's really the 60s, you know, it starts in the 60s, the late 60s in particular, is that this environmental movement sort of took advantage of the fact that people under capitalism, or at least the rough capitalism we had, weren't quite enough focused on clean air and clean water and environmental quality. And they use that to put over this idea, okay, the solution is just let's eliminate our impact or let's minimize our impact, period. And so they owned this issue of environmental quality, but then they packaged it together with this anti-human opposition to all of our impact, to all of industry. And in the 70s in particular, they were explicitly anti-technology and explicitly anti-population growth. In fact, for mandatory population uh, shrinking. And so I think what should have happened is that the pro-capitalism side should have owned the issue of environmental quality and said, hey, we believe in a society of property rights, and that includes defining clear thresholds of pollution based on the state of the economy and of technology, where we limit pollution, and that's part of protecting people's rights. And actually, capitalism, and especially property rights, those are the keys to environmental quality. And to your great example, look at the Soviet Union, right? Look at what happens when you don't have property rights. You have uh, environmental abominations. And, And unfortunately, that didn't happen. And so part of what I'm trying to do with my work is to say, no, we should be about intelligently impacting nature. We should advance human flourishing on earth. And that absolutely includes environmental quality. That absolutely includes safety, but that's an aspect of pursuing human flourishing. So another question that comes to mind from the list I auto-generated here is you talked about how, you know, 80% of the fossil fuel mix um, is 80% of the energy. 80% mix, of energy. Yeah, yeah energy is fossil, is, is, is fossil fuels. Can you do the breakdown of like what the percentages are there in terms of like coal, natural gas, like oil, th- those bits? So within, so they're all quite large w- within the 80s. So if yeah, you look at the world. This is just energy overall. When you subdivide like electricity, that's different from industrial heat energy, which is different from transportation, which the second two are more dominated by fossil fuels. Um, so what we have is basically the, t- the subtitle of the book is, so, so just people can see it. I guess you can see it behind me, but you can't see the subtitle. Why global human flourishing requires more oil, coal, and natural gas, not less. So that's very deliberate because oil is number one, coal is number two. And natural gas is number three. There's some evidence that, I mean, they could switch over time, but it's been that way for for quite a while. And there are reasons for that, but one of the reasons is oil is, is sort of the most special of all because it has such a high energy concentration or what's called energy density. It's just particularly amazing for any kind of mobility and human beings really, really like and benefit from the ability to move around and have machines that move around. And and there's nothing better right now than oil. Although, as I talk about in the book, in the future, we could eventually have nuclear powered things that would even, that would be even better than oil powered things. But the environmental movement has basically been putting a stop to nuclear for 50 years. So it's, it's become very difficult. And something I'm also curious about too, is you following up on that statement, you just talked about how, you know, for a hundred plus years, we've had all these forms of fossil fuels. And then you essentially say that they have one out and that's a demonstration of their viability and, and what they're really providing. The, the obvious environmentalist pushback on that is that there's a market failure 
that's gone mm-hmm. on right now, which is that to explain the idea that the price, right? Let's say the cheapness of these fossil fuels has not factored in environmental destruction, carbon impacts, mm-hmm. all those bits, fossil fuel subsidies that the government gives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do you respond to this like argument that fossil fuels have won out in an unfair way? And that's why we should do a carbon tax. That's why we should have cap and trade, put a price on these things to better allocate where things could turn out. Because as people like Michael Mann would say, a world where we put a price on carbon, for example, would be a world where hmm, maybe the coal isn't quite as competitive relative to, let's say, um, renewables or even nuclear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you asked me, asked me in advance what I wanted to be asked about that people had asked about. Nobody's asked that yet, at least this week. And that's one of my favorite parts of the book uh, that I'm really looking forward to responses to. In chapter four, I talk about uh, very aggressively the pseudoscience uh, of externality calculations that, that people make. So let me just give a sort of common sense thing, and then I'll get into the, the details of it. Like I was, I was debating a few years ago with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's since become like known for other things, which we won't talk about. But uh, we were talking about uh, this issue. And he's like, oh yeah, you don't price in the externalities. And part of what I'm asking is, okay, well, what do you think they should be priced at? Like, what should a gallon of gasoline cost? And his view is, you know, well over $12 a gallon. And this was, I don't know what it was at the time, $3 a gallon. So what he's saying is energy should be massively more expensive for the average person. And my allegedly scientific calculation is leading to that. Okay. Well, just as a and quick extra- thing, could you explain what an externality actually is? I didn't do quite yeah. proper explanation of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, and it goes into this 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 pricing thing, right? So the externality is an effect of something like a sort of economically uh, meaningful effect of something that's not reflected in the price. So an example I give in the book is like you make uh, a hydroelectric dam, and there are positive externalities and negative externalities. So it could disrupt some part of nature that you like. And that's not, nobody really paid for that. So that'd be a negative externality, but it could also prevent you from flooding, right? And that would be a positive externality. You didn't pay for either of those, but you got them. And and I'm glad you asked because one key aspect of this is there are positive and negative externalities by this externality approach. And notice that what we hear about fossil fuels is only negative externalities, which we're going to get into that in a second. So if you look at China, if China had followed uh, and we can throw in India as well. If China and India had followed like Robert F. Kennedy's vision, they absolutely would not have been able to afford uh, to industrialize. And if you look at the industrialization, this has clearly increased the life expectancy by more than 10 years in both countries over the last uh, you know, four or five decades. And it has clearly made the average person's life much better, even despite some significant pollution problems. It's, I mean, you look at life expectancy in you know, a lot of places in China, it's 80. Like it's just unbelievable how much better life has become. And there is zero chance that had you done these externality payments where you had to pay two, three, four, five times as much for energy, you could have done that because this is a related point. There is nothing that is close to fossil fuels today. So the reason that they dominate in all of these different environments, like everywhere around the world, even places like Japan, which have no re- no domestic desire to use them at all, they don't have the resources, but they have to import them, is because just there's nothing close to fossil fuels in terms of low cost, reliable, versatile, scalable energy, which means what happens is if you just make them a lot more expensive, that just means a lot of people can't afford them in one way or another. There's no, there's no getting around that. So the technical thing that's going on, there are two technical things that are going wrong with this idea. Oh, we need to pay more for fossil fuels. So actually there are three. So one is the negative externality calculations are in our total BS, like absolute BS. And the climate one is the most obvious because what we know with climate is that we're far safer than ever from climate and that fossil fueled climate mastery is a clear cause. So you're talking about these, you have like these organizations saying there are trillions of dollars of climate costs but we're 50 times less likely to die from a climate related cause, how can you possibly claim that? So these numbers are totally arbitrary. And if you look at the carbon uh, cost literature, it just goes from the idea is that, oh, CO2 could be extremely positive or extremely negative, and there are no real estimates. So one is these negatives are arbitrary and obviously overstated. The second is there are massive positive externalities to fossil fuels, not just that CO2 is good in some ways because of greening and because warming is desirable in many places, because by the way, the world is a place where many times more people die of cold than of heat and warming tends to occur in colder places. So it disproportionately benefit those people. But the main thing, and this is the thing that's totally evaded, 
is that there are huge positive externalities of energy in general. So the more you live in an empowered world, the more time that is freed up for innovation. And so one example I like to use is coal in the 1970s. So people say, we shouldn't have been using coal, we should have priced it. But the fact that coal was low cost and that we could use it, what did that enable us to do? It enables us to have lives where we can spend a lot of time thinking. And that led to things like the internet. And that led to revolutions in medical care. So any form of energy that's lower cost has enormous positive externalities. And yet people don't talk about that. And then the final thing, and, and I'd rec really recommend just looking at chapter four for the details, is there are problems with this whole idea of like, there's an assumption here that the, that the cost of something that we pay is some perfect measure of its value. And that is not remotely true. Um, so actually fossil fuels often generate far, far more value than we pay for them. So an example is like, you could pay $20 for a Barbie doll, which by the way is made of fossil fuels, or $20 for the fuel that will fuel a helicopter will save your life. How much is the second thing worth? I mean, if you have whatever you have almost, it's worth, it's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if you have that. And yet that's not reflected in the price. And so what happens is if you just make things more expensive, you're depriving people. That means fewer people can afford these amazingly valuable things. So you're depriving people of huge amounts of value. And that's part of what would have happened in China. It's just, they would have been deprived of this huge amount of value of industrialization because you would have put it out of their reach because you had this ridiculous idea that the price of it is the same as the value of it. And I'm glad that you talked about India China, because it actually brings to mind a, a question you tend to get from the pushback perspective, which is that at a core level, how much of these dynamics are about capitalism versus socialism versus communism? Because I'm sure you've heard this, you know, you'll see people who, especially younger folks who are, you know, in favor of the Green New Deal or broader action on climate change, they'll say like, this is like a, this is a capitalism problem. This is a late stage capitalism issue. I was just debating someone around this a few weeks ago, yet I don't think communist China or you know, statist India or communist, the communist Soviet Union were, were inherently superior when it comes to environmental degradation, CO2 emissions, like these bits. So how should we think of like economic models as driving these underlying dynamics positively or negatively? So I, I give this fundamental alternative of like, is your, is your view of earth that you want to advance human flourishing on earth or you want to eliminate human impact on earth? And you could theoretically have these models for both a free society and an unfree society. The free society is harder to argue because people in a free society will choose to impact the earth because it's in their interest, but you can have people who voluntarily choose not to, who choose to be ascetics and that kind of thing. They're just going to almost certainly be in the minority. But it's really interesting among, like if you look at capitalism versus statism, uh, different forms of statism, what's happened historically is you've had both attitudes, so, or rather both of them have had the attitude of we should advance human flourishing on earth through intelligently impacting it. So you look at say the Soviet Union, what it aspired to be and what socialism aspired to be in the early 20th century was this would be an even more successful form of industrialization, that we would be far more productive. You know, we're going to bury you, this kind of thing. And what, uh, the really interesting and, and I would say tragic development was when socialism slash communism failed. And this is a point I learned from Ayn Rand, so I should give her credit. She had a book called The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution. And when you look at um, what happened is when it became clear that socialism did not outproduce capitalism, and in, in fact, it led to starvation and all of these terrible things, uh, the, the left had this decision, okay, do we embrace capitalism now because we really want industry and advancing human flourishing on earth? Or do we stick with different forms of statism uh, because we don't really care about production and industry and that kind of thing? And really what they chose and promoted and, and fed through all the schools and the media is this environmental movement, which says that no, capitalism is evil because it impacts our environment and impacting our environment is bad. And so it's this really anti-human turn. So a lot of the old left would, would find the new left unrecognizable. And if you look at, say, the um, like the people you're talking about today who say, oh, yeah, this is really about socialism, et cetera, they have this anti-human, anti-impact view of socialism. So it's no longer, oh, socialism is going to lead to this worker's paradise where we're all super productive and we get a much greater cut 
of the profits, or there aren't even profits, just we get a fair distribution. It's not about that. It's about human beings, like let's eat bugs. Let's not have so many kids, this kind of thing. So it's this very like ascetic, uh, I would say tragically anti-human socialism. And so I do, I do have some allies who are kind of old left uh, holdovers who will just say, but there are very few of them, unfortunately, who will just say, yeah, like I'm a socialist. Uh, and obviously we should impact the earth, but I think we should do it in a collectivist way. And I disagree with that. But that's at least an attempt at being pro-human versus saying, no, let's have socialism so we can sort of have everyone not impact the earth and therefore starve and suffer equally. I'd like you to talk about the developing world, global south. There's a bunch of different words we use to describe this dynamic of this because you frame this very directly by saying that you know there are 3 billion people like in these regions of the globe that are not benefiting from fossil fuels in the way that you would ideally well, not, They're not them. benefiting enough. They're, they're massively benefiting, which is a very important point. And I would actually say, you could say like there are 6 billion people who by our standards are ridiculously poor, but sorry, mm-hmm. you can continue the question. No, no, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, clarification there. It really feels as if these folks are basically the central battleground where a lot of these debates actually happen. So for example, um, have you, have you, have you read, um, what is it? The um, Ministry of the Future? I haven't. So this is a book by Kim Stanley Robinson. He's a famous like science fiction writer. He wrote the really great um, Mars trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. And his latest book is about just climate change. And it starts off with this like really harrowing uh, beginning. Um, it won all the big awards last year where all these people in India um, die um, because of um, just overwhelming heat, um, temperature. Um, and this is something that happens routinely, especially in South Asia. So how should we think of these concentrated impacts of climate change, especially in the developing world where you don't have air conditioning, you don't have a lot of these benefits of this system, mm-hmm. while you're also describing the fact that, these, that, that those parts of the world are also benefiting too. So it, it really feels as if within this framing, there's this kind of up for grabs element to like thinking about the global South and the benefits and the costs of fossil fuels. Yeah, this is another example where we're just totally neglecting the benefits of fossil fuels and and overstating the side effects. And I talk about specifically the issue of heat around the world in chapter seven of Fossil Future. If people check it out, so you can you can get a lot of the details there. But even India is funny because not funny, but like there are more cold related deaths in India than heat related deaths. Like even in India, like cold is a huge huge problem. And and this is just something that's not mentioned. And the main thing is that. Like these, the changes in climate we're talking about that are remotely plausible, like these are very slow changes in the average temperature. You know, we're talking about like a few degrees Celsius at most, really over a hundred years. Think about how insignificant that is compared to whether you have like a productive and prosperous society because you have low cost, reliable energy that can power all of these amazing machines. Like imagine we talk about, well, the undeveloped world doesn't have air conditioning. Well, why the hell not? Why isn't that the focus in terms of empowering those people uh, <clears throat> as quickly as possible? And so I think it's just ridiculous to, to condescend. I mean, it, it, like imagine it was, you're talking about Florida or something. You're like, oh, Florida is so hot and humid and like the, the impacts are worse there. And but you know, imagine you could you could go back in time with Florida and say, okay, we're going to prevent it from getting one degree warmer in exchange for you staying in mass poverty because we really care about you, right? We want to protect you from the heat. They'd be like, what the are you talking about? Like, let us industrialize, let us empower, then we can master climate, and it's going to be a, a little bit hotter, but life is going to be infinitely better. And that's how I think we should view the rest of the world. The the other thing I want I was stressing with just we haven't. It's really important. People have this idea of climate justice and even, even some people uh, who are generally pro-fossil fuels for the what I call the unempowered world, they tend to view this of, oh yeah, well, we have benefited from fossil fuels, but we kind of screwed the rest of the world over. And so we should keep that in mind and maybe give some payments. Like we didn't screw anyone over fundamentally, not certainly not by using fossil fuels because fossil fuels have made us just incredibly productive, prosperous, including innovative. And if you look at the world, there's skyrocketing life expectancy everywhere in the world, including places that don't use a lot of energy. 
in part because of charitable things that we can do, but in part because of huge medical innovations. Um, so there's just, the world is so much better because a certain portion of the world has used a lot of fossil fuel. And yes, we absolutely want others to be free to do so and to do so, or to you know find other cost-effective ways of producing and using energy. But um, this idea that like we've ruined the world for anyone using fossil fuels is the opposite of the truth. We've made the world a much better place for everyone, but there are some people who still need the world to be a much, much better place. And it's totally immoral for us to stop them. So we've really focused on the moral case for mm-hmm. this fossil fuel centric worldview you're describing. But I think the way you introduced this idea was very helpful because you said there's, we should, which is what we've mm-hmm. been talking about, but then there's, we're going to anyways. I think this is kind of the more interesting part of this issue for me, because what anyone, you know, and they're part of the listenership who've already like probably turned the episode off by now uh, because they're a little more to the left on these topics. But what what they have to reckon with, I think you've been very articulate and especially in the book, is this idea that this is all happening yes. regardless of basically anything. Like put aside the you know obvious fact that there's no way that serious climate legislation would make it through the House or the Senate, um, given just the political dynamics in the U.S. right now, this road you're describing is inherently inevitable. And I think that's very difficult to really reckon with for, for a lot of people. So can you just basically describe that aspect of this, which is moral case aside, let's put aside that side of it. Why do you think this is the inevitable future, given where we are going as a United States and just the world broadly? Well, let's say let's say very, very likely, because I, I do think it is important that we, I mean, human beings can choose things and we could choose to rapidly get rid of a lot of fossil fuel use, um, but we won't, I mean, because of the moral case in large part, because of the elements of a moral case for fossil fuel use. So I mentioned, like, what are these elements? The elements are energy is crucial. It's desperately needed for people to have better lives. Fossil fuels are uniquely good at providing it at today's scale and at the far greater needed scale. Like these are reasons why people are not going to give them up. And I believe they shouldn't give them up. It's weird because people say like, hey, Alex, you be- like, you're so, you're so contrarian, right? You're for fossil fuels. You're for more fossil fuels. But guess what? I'm, I, I don't try to be contrarian or non-contrarian, but in this case, I'm, the world is with me. Everyone's just saying something different, but they're actually using a lot of fossil fuel, not as much as I think, but they're using, they should, but they use, everyone is using a lot of fossil fuel and the use keeps growing uh, because we on some level know that it's good, all things considered. We know that there's just so uniquely beneficial and yeah, there are side effects that we might not like, but overall it's really, really uh, good for us. And so if you look at these dynamics, what, what can happen is for a certain amount of time, <clears throat> certain people can be deluded. So they can say this happened, I think, with today's energy crisis, where people thought in Europe, for example, oh, we don't need to produce fossil fuel. We don't need to invest in it. We don't need to invest in infrastructure to import it from allies uh, because we're going to be done with it pretty soon. And what happens is you rely, you you put in a lot of solar and wind, which that always depends on near 100% reliable backup in the case of solar and wind, mostly via natural gas, which is the thing that's best at accommodating the erratic ups and downs of um of solar and wind. And so you still need that. And then you find that, oh, wait, we're still super dependent on Russia and Russia can just totally manipulate us. And if we're Germany, they can actually kill us if they want to, not by war, but just by cutting off supply. So th- there's just been these realities. And I talk about this in Fossil Future, like these realities are only going to become more apparent. When where I am in California, you see blackouts, like more and more, I have to think about, hey, what do I do? about blackouts. How does my job work? I've had, you know, in 2020, we had all the blackouts. I had two events, remote events, because it's COVID in part that, you know, that's part of my livelihood. And like, I had to find a different place to go because there's a blackout in my area. Or in one case, I call in on the phone, right, to give a speech, which is just embarrassing in freaking 2020. Uh, but th- there's just, there's all of this, people are facing all of the realities that make it good to use fossil fuels. And so this idea that we shouldn't do it is just going to keep uh, it's going to be contradicted, even though, look, everyone in the world is saying that they're going to go net zero. Companies are saying it. Investors are saying it. Or net, they zero, have been. net zero emissions. Net, yeah, sorry, net zero emissions. So um, 
yeah, I'm too used to the term. So net zero CO2 emissions, that basically means eliminating almost all fossil fuel use in the next, by 2050, so the next 27 and a half years. This is just totally delusional. And I think one, one thing that's happening is because even a small attempt to implement fossil fuel elimination, which is really just slowing it down so far, slowing down its growth, that has already led to disastrous energy crisis. So I do think we're at a uniquely teachable moment where people are open to questioning this assumption that, oh yeah, the world is actually going away from fossil fuels. Like it is not, and it is not going to do so quickly. And, and if you wanted it to do so more quickly, you would have to liberate nuclear, uh, which we absolutely should do as soon as possible. But even if you did that, it would still be a fossil future for quite a long time. And unfortunately, when I try to liberate it, I face a lot of resistance. Yeah, we're, we're in the part where I want to get to alternatives, especially for yeah. folks who uh, are a little less sympathetic to your, to your point of view, but I think it also recognize w- what you really just said there. Talk about the nuclear side of this. Um, it seems like nuclear is in, and there's been a couple of like mainstream media articles about this, like we're, the, the, the Overton window on nuclear has clearly expanded in mm-hmm. the past three or four Months. I think mm-hmm. there's been some very good efforts to rebrand, refocus, turn this more into like a high technology thing rather than, you know, 1970s, 1980s grime. So can mm-hmm. you just talk about the nuclear side? That's it. Nuclear is a really big tragedy because it has this unbelievably amazing potential that we have very strong evidence can be actualized because we actually already had a lot of success with it, particularly in the 70s. So in the 70s, we could build nuclear power plant in four years. We could do it at relatively low cost, provides extremely reliable electricity, extremely safe, which is the opposite of what most people think, and you know, totally clean. And in terms of even things like mining, it takes a lot less mining than, say, solar panels and wind turbines because the energy of the nuclear material is so concentrated that you just have to do less mining for it, it requires less land. So it's just this amazing technology, but unfortunately it was demonized as this unique danger. And there was this conflation of a nuclear power plant, nuclear bomb, even though it's physically impossible for a nuclear power plant to explode like a nuclear bomb can. But mostly the modern environmental movement, because I believe their real hostility is toward all human impact, they really hated nuclear because they regarded it as, hey, this is a new way of impacting nature, splitting the atom, creating this new waste, which by the way, is not very hard for humans to deal with, but they thought it was immoral for us to do this new thing that created waste that would last a long time. And so they manufactured all of this phony safety concern, whereas in fact, again, nuclear is the safest form of energy. So that led to a, a level of regulation that I consider essentially criminalizing it to where now it'll take 16 years to build a plant plants can easily get canceled. Um, Activists can stop it at every single stage. And it's just become uneconomic to the point where since the creation of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1975, so this is now now what, 47 years ago. Uh, 1975, there's been not one nuclear plant that has gone through the entire process of conception to completion. And the closest ones are absolute price debacles. So it's, it's just a huge tragedy because there's every reason to think it would be great. The, the, the nuclear material, it has these magical attributes that I talk, talk about in chapter five, which are part of why fossil fuels are good. So they're naturally stored. They're like a battery that you can just release energy on demand versus solar and wind, which are a flow of energy that's intermittent that you can't release on demand. You can't control. It's super, super concentrated, much more concentrated even than oil. And it's super abundant. So there's just every reason to be excited about nuclear and we have a good track record of doing it. And yet we've just tragically criminalized it. And and if the US doesn't decriminalize it, the rest of the world is just not usually as innovative because it doesn't have the degree of freedom that we tend to. So what you tend to get is people are doing sort of slightly different versions of older things. And then you have people doing some newer things. By the way, the older things are great. Like we could empower a lot of the world just with the old nuclear technology. So I don't like this fetishism of new nuclear because old nuclear done properly could be really, really good. Uh, But we would want it to evolve, but it's not in part because the US isn't taking a leadership role. We do have a lot of small scale things, including what's called nuclear fusion, which is a, a different variety of nuclear technology than the one we use today, but none of those really work yet. And, uh, the, the same apparatus that criminalizes old nuclear is also making it very hard to build new nuclear. So I, I view nuclear as this amazing alternative, but right now it's about 5% of the world's energy. So in a world that needs far more energy, it is not going to replace fossil fuels. I mean, 
if it started any replacement in a generation, I would regard that as a wonderful development, but I, I would not bet on it. I mean, I just replacement of any supply of fossil fuels. I don't mean, because we need far more energy. So one of the points I make in chapter five is when you're looking at alternatives, you have to look at alternatives to power a world that needs far more energy. It's not just alternatives with today's mix. It's with tomorrow's mix where far more people have far more opportunity and therefore using far more energy. And the other alternative that really comes out here, not that it's that limited, but um, is really this climate mastery idea, which we kind of just brushed over and focused more at the the top level of things. Just what are like the specifics? Like what would you, so would you say that how does climate mastery, as you describe it, dif- um, differ from the status quo, from what we are doing right now, as you articulate it in the book? Well, most of what I'm pointing out is that we, in the freer parts of the world and the more empowered parts of the world, that is the places that are using cost-effective energy to use machines to improve their lives, we are engaging in this. So a lot of the point of it is to point out what we're doing because we don't grasp that we're doing it. So chapter four or chapter seven rather is all about climate mastery and has the details of, and what I do is I go through every form of climate related disaster. So you can have dangerous temperatures or extreme temperatures, you can have uh, drought, wildfire, storms, floods, including sea level rises associated with that. So you go through all of those. And what you see is that we're safer than ever from all of those things. And this is not recognized at all. I point out in each case, there's this narrative that, oh, we're more endangered than ever. But it's not true. The reason we have this narrative is that we have this idea that the climate was this delicate nurturer before we impacted it, whereas we don't recognize it was really this wrecking ball before we impacted it. And, and uh, our, whatever our impact has been, positive or negative, has been pretty trivial compared to our mastery ability. So you know, I go through every single thing, but you know, with warming, uh, you know, the most obvious thing is, well, warming and it being too hot or too cold, too cold being actually the bigger problem for most people. But, you know, that's the most obvious one. That's climate, you know, that's heating machines and cooling machines. But then also the, all the machines you use to build like modern infrastructure, including insulation and all of these other things we don't think about. But then drought. So with drought, what do you have is you have irrigation machines that can take, you know, places that are experiencing a natural drought, but still feel... Uh, feed all the crops and be doing well, or you can have, uh, you know, drought relief ships that are taking uh, food cargo. I mean, these things save millions of lives. If you look, I, I have statistics, not statistics, well, statistics, but also stories about the thirties where you have places in China where just million, literally millions of people get wiped out by these drought related famines or a flood related famine because they just don't have the mastery ability. Now today that's unimaginable because you can you can make the area so much more resilient and you can also bring stuff in if you need more food, for example, or more water, for example. And so you just go through all the other categories and in every case you see we're using these amazing machines to protect ourselves from climate uh, to the point where we're masters of climate. And what that means is that when you're thinking about future changes in climate, one thing is you can't only think about negative, you also need to think about positive changes. You can't assume all our change is bad, which is very common to do. But the main thing is you need to factor in our mastery ability. And I argue with that factor, it's very hard to even think of what would be a real problem for human beings. Because like temperatures, again, the world is still pretty cold. That's not gonna do it at the levels we're talking about. Only if the temperatures just accelerated out of control Yes, that would do it. But we know the history of the planet, this doesn't happen because we've had 15 times more CO2 and it didn't happen that way. And I talk about the physics of this in chapter nine, but basically warming warming is what's called logarithmic or diminishing. So you get you add more CO2 and it still warms, but you get diminishing returns. So each molecule warms less than the last. That's the basic dynamic uh, there. And so what are you worried about? Like, are the storms really going to get five times more intense or two? T- like, this just science fiction. Why would that happen? Why would I, and why would everything get worse? That's this primitive religious superstition that, oh, our impact is going to ruin everything and Gaia is going to punish us. So just kind of one, one comment to wrap up this perspective that's particularly directed at those who think of themselves on the left. I think the way I want to just categorize where I am, because I think the normal categories we have are bad, which is either, either it's usually you're a climate change believer and then you think fossil fuels are bad, or you're a climate change denier and you think fossil fuels are okay. And I'm trying to, that's a false alternative, I think, because you can believe that fossil fuels impact climate. uh, But A, you can think that 
the benefits far outweigh any negatives of that uh, climate effect. And B, you can really you can really precisely weigh, and you need to the the climate impacts. So, including being open to positive things like what are the benefits of warming in a cold world? What are the benefits of more CO two in the atmosphere? And so, I just really want to sort of break people of this idea that oh, if you're if you're pro fossil fuels, you must not believe that we impact climate. I totally believe we impact climate. We impact a lot of things, but I think the overall benefit of using fossil fuels when you factor in its climate impacts, negative and positive climate impacts, is unbelievably positive. And part of the evidence of that is that we are far safer from climate than ever because of this very clear climate mastery ability. So I'm, I'm hoping people are open to that perspective and don't just think of it as, oh, you're a denier, you're a believer. Those are That has a religious tinge to it as well. Like, oh, you believe in my thing and therefore you agree with my policy versus what's the actual science? And how does that fit into the rest of our knowledge about the benefits and side effects of fossil fuels? Well, that's a good place to leave it. Alex, this has been really great. We'd love for you just to shout the book and it's full, to your point, full subtitle out for folks. It's available in our bookshop, but this has been really helpful. You have, you said at your bookshop, you have a bookshop? Well, we have a, it's bookshop.org. So it's just, uh, it's uh, independent sellers. We get a commission. Um, oh, all, awesome. all the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all just, right. a, just a website. All right, well, buy, buy so many of this book that these guys get richer if they're already rich, that they're even richer <laughs> than they are. So it's it's big, uh, which may be daunting. So it's, it's Fossil Future, Why Global Human Flourishing Requires More Oil, Coal, and Natural Gas, Not Less. And I just say that like this is written for people who expect to disagree with it. So that's one thing. So I like, I think if you expect to disagree, you'll be really interested and surprised by the argument, but also because it's written for people to disagree with it, it, it covers so much so precisely that if you expect to agree with it, it'll be just as good for you because it'll really give you a lot of ammunition and clear ways to explain your points. And then the final thing is thanks everyone for, uh, for considering this. Because I, I, you know, I didn't used to agree with all this stuff, and I was convinced by a certain thought process. So maybe you'll find it interesting as well. Very helpful. Once again, Alex, thank you for joining us on the realignment. My pleasure. 